Yeah, I think so. Do you want to say anything? Sure. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody, this morning. Glad you're here. Um, last night was amazing. I've had uh, multiple people come to, and tell me what they took away from last night, and um, a lot of people blessed. So uh, you're going to be blessed this morning. And I'm excited that Andy's here. Andy isn't a, uh, a well-known teacher, but he's well-known in the kingdom of God because of the message that he carries. So it's exciting for me to have him here because I feel like um, this is a step. This is one step in the right direction of what God's getting ready to do in can. And uh, we've taken many steps, but this is just like another, another notch in the belt. So, Father, I thank you today for your presence. Thank you, my love. We're hungry. We're tired of men's doctrines. We want you. We desire you. Holy Ghost, teach us. Father, I thank you for using Andy today to equip us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, sir. Okay. Let me scoot you over this way and get a little sense of equilibrium. If that's not too distracting for you, because for some people, they're like, you're a little off center the whole morning. <laughs> Our family has enjoyed this. There's this uh, Amazon Prime series called Monk. Have any of y'all ever seen that? It's about an OCD uh, inspector, private eye, and he cannot stand anything being out of place. And that is like uh, so far removed from me. It helps me understand my wife a little bit more. <laughs> but thank God she's not OCD. She just... Things don't belong there, honey. <laughs> so uh, if it wasn't for her, uh, I would not have, uh, I would probably be wearing the same clothes for the last three weeks. So, all right. Yes, well, uh, this, this conference is called the Greater Things Conference. And the reason that it's called the Greater Things Conference is because that was what the Lord spoke to my heart. Uh, so I'm excited because He has greater things in store for this region and for each one of you in your personal lives. Um, but it's not about just us. I was ta talking to Michael. I was talking to his father this morning. When you recognize what God can do through one person, you stop counting noses. He shared, uh, Pastor Michael's father shared a story this morning about how an evangelist was led of God to go all the way from uh, England to New York at the invitation of 10 women who were praying down at the basement. He ended up preaching to 10 old ladies who'd been Christian their whole lives, and they brought one 10-year-old boy who got saved, and his name was David Living who ended up leading, leading Africa, a whole continent, into the gospel. Um, and so I'm very excited about being here to invest into your lives. I know that uh, it's difficult for people to get away in the morning, in the middle of the week. Uh, so I'm assuming that you all are here because you're hungry, that you're excited, uh, and that you're making your lives available for the gospel. Uh, there's going to be meetings in the night times at 7 p.m., so 10.30 and 7 p.m., and we'll do that for the next three days. Um, so let me read our theme verse for the conference, and then we're going to uh, get into the particular of today. So if you have a Bible and you want to turn to John chapter 14, I want to read our theme verse and then I'm going to read a little bit of context. John chapter 14 verse 12, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. Now, this has been a, in a, a verse in my Bible that was like a pebble in my shoe for a long time because I, I was like, where are these works? You know, forget uh, greater works. Let me just first see the works that Jesus did, right? <laughs> and then what on earth is greater works? Because it looked like Jesus was just tearing up, you know, everything. He was, he was healing the sick, casting out demons. He was... 
setting people free left and right. And he says, he who believes in me, that means me. Because Jesus, I believe in you, will do the same works. And I'm like, I'm not doing them same works. <laughs> What's wrong? Where's the disconnect? Um, and so I would ask all my friends about this. And they would tell me, oh, that Jesus was talking only to his disciples at that time because he knew they were going to need miracles. But then, now that we have the Bible, we don't need miracles anymore. Because the miracles were there to show people, you can trust what these people say. But after the Bibles all, all come together, everybody knows you can just trust the Bible, right? That would be very similar to them saying, you know what, you needed guns in, in a military, uh, but now that we have the Constitution... We don't need a military anymore. That's not true, is it? But it's not true either. You know, I kept, one of the reasons that I went to seminary was not because I felt like I needed to uh, spend lots of money. In, in, it wasn't because I wanted a career uh, as a clergyman. It was because I wanted to know the Word of God. And I, one particular area that I had to search out was, God, what do you, does your Word teach about your works? Do, uh, are the works of the Holy Spirit, healing the sick, speaking in tongues, signs and wonders and miracles, are those temporary until we get the Bible, or are those for us today? And I... I kept reading over and over, and I just became convinced that some people decided that they were smarter than Jesus. Because, and that's dumb. If you ever get to the place where you think that Jesus is wrong, that's stupid, okay? No matter how smart you think you are. But Jesus said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and even greater, because I go to the Father. Now. That is going to be the theme, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to equip you. It, we're not just going to talk about it. We're going to equip you so that you can release these greater works in your life uh, because that's who Jesus is, all right? We're not just going to preach sermons. We're, there's going to be a lot of the Word because the Word is what equips us, but, but there's got to come a place where you actually get a chance to do the Word, amen? Uh, so we don't want to just be hearers only, but we want to be doers as well. Um, so that is the major theme of what we're going to be focusing on. But for this morning, uh, I want to call your attention to this little last phrase. Jesus says, what is the reason that we're going to be able to do greater works? Because he goes to the Father. So there's something that had to take place so that Jesus could do His works through us. Now here's something really important. You need to get this. Jesus believes He can do His works through any believer. Jesus believes that. And so if you have been taught that He can't do His works through you, or He might not be able to, or you've got to get somebody else to help you, Jesus says this is something for any believer. So if you're a believer, Jesus believes He can do His works through you. And the reason that He can do His works through us is because He's gone to the Father. There is something amazing that Jesus has accomplished that He hadn't accomplished up to this point. That's good. He had to accomplish something, That's right. right? What was He doing? Here's something that's amazing. See, God created you and me to be bearers of His image so that if somebody wanted to see what God was like, they could come to any human being. And then he, God's got a, a, a monitor screen that He can show Himself through because inside we're plugged in. Yeah. God's Spirit resides in us. And we, we have a, we've all been created as vessels. Amen? Uh, and so we're, our, we're called a temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, a temple is just an empty building until it becomes, somebody moves into it, right? And so now uh, our bodies are called a temple of the Holy Spirit. You, every person who's here has been born with a mind, has been born with a heart, who's been born uh, with a, a will. And our mind desperately needs truth. Amen? Your mind was born empty. Ask any parent in here. 
<laughs> Children don't know too much, and their minds are crying out for truth and for wisdom. Jesus Christ is truth. The yeah. Spirit of God is truth. And so your mind was meant to be plugged into somebody else's mind like gears so that their thoughts and their wisdom are what operating in your mind. And you need to understand this, that if you're not plugged into the mind of Christ, you are plugged into somebody else's mind. It's the prince of the power of the air uh, who's at work in the sons of disobedience. Uh, in James, it says there's a wisdom from above and there's a wisdom from below. It's fleshly, it's selfish, it's demonic, it's prideful. And do you know what? Devilish thinking is prideful, self-centered, arrogant, and we all come out of the womb very self-oriented. You know, somebody takes our stuff from us and we don't go, oh, that's okay, you can have it. You go, Wah! give it to me. And if we were stronger, man, we would just rip somebody's arm off to get that thing. I mean, you see them little babies that we were at Cracker Barrel the other day, just yesterday. And there was a two-year-old, I'm telling you, if she was stronger, she'd flip the table over on her whole family. <laughs> she was upset, man. And she was screaming out. She didn't care who in that restaurant she upset. She wanted her little, uh, she was already addicted to that little screen. And she, I give it back, you know. And her parents are just trying to placate her with just turn and just become a mind jello, you know. Be careful, people. You can be careful. Sometimes, sometimes what's being uh, offered in terms of discipline is just a form of addiction. So we have to be careful about that. Now, uh, so here's the thing that God created us to be filled with His mind, to be filled with His heart, to be our wills need direction. Amen. And so we were meant to be expressions of the will in the mind of God. So He made us to be containers of His Spirit. You are a God container. That's who you are. You're like a bottle of water. And when you have a bottle of water and it's filled with water and it's sealed, you know you're sealed in the Holy Spirit, you get the same pressures. You can stand on that bottle of water, but if it's filled and sealed, as soon as you take your foot off, it just pops right back into shape because pressure on the outside doesn't get onto the inside. What's inside fills it, sustains it, gives it strength and freedom. Jesus said that every person is going to go through trials. You're going to have wind and wave come against your house. Everybody. But those whose lives are founded on the rock of obeying God, of being filled with God, His mind, His heart, His will, that you're going to stand when others do not. And Jesus saw all... He, he, after At the fall, God lost His image bearers. We were taken captive. We were surrounded. We were kidnapped by a malicious, lying, prideful, selfish, insecure thief. That's right. And we became subject to his spirit, to his deception, to his mindset, to his feelings. That's why as soon as God walked back into the garden and Adam and Eve had fallen, they hid, they ran from God. And they blamed one another and they blamed the devil and wouldn't take any responsibility. Why? Because they were too afraid to face the truth. Because now they felt like somehow the truth of God is against them rather than for them. They believed the worst about God. They didn't believe in His grace. They didn't believe in redemption. They, they covered themselves. They felt shame. And people have been killing one another. People have been arguing with one another. They've, they've been selfish ever since then. And God gave them His law to say, okay, well, you want to go on your own? Here's just Ten basic commands, you know, worship me, don't worship other things, 
obey your parents, honor your parents, don't sleep with somebody who's not your spouse, don't steal stuff. I mean, basic stuff. This is not hard stuff. This is stuff that's just basic. Don't tell lies, you know. And everybody believes those are good commands, but nobody can do them. Not a single person on the face of this planet can do them. And more than that, mo a lot of people just, well, forget it. And we, and, and we just go about, well, I'm just going to do what's good for me. And see, here's the problem. Here's the problem. It's not just that people do bad. It's that people do right in their own eyes. They do what's right to them in their own mindset. Well, I'm not so bad. You look at you, and you know, and they're and they've got all these reasons that they're right. Now, when you get a whole planet full of people like this, or even just get one household of people like this, what's right for me ain't right for you. I remember I did a, uh, I was invited to do a uh, a marriage seminar in Africa, and here's how I started it off. I said. Before I start teaching about Christian marriage from my, uh, you know, I, I want to find out what are some of the problems that y'all have in, in, in your marriages here in Africa? And it was a little quiet and a few guys raised their hand and said, well, in Africa, one of the main problems that we have in our marriage is that the women, blah, 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 blah. and then, you know, five hands from the women shot up. And then they said, in Africa, the men always, blah, 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 blah. and then, you know, 10 hands from the men shot up. It was back and forth, man. And I'm telling you, within five minutes, I had to calm them down because they were getting ready to come to blows, you know. And they were trying to convince me who the problem was. And I said, hey, why don't we step back because I, I kind of see a pattern here. The men are pointing to the women being the problem the women are pointing to the men being the problem what if the real problem is selfishness what if the real problem is selfishness is keeping us from being able to love so I believe that the only solution is that we meet Jesus at the cross and that we die to ourself and that marriage is actually the place that we are to learn the love of God that we learn to love others as much as we love ourselves. Amen? Well, that doesn't, that's not just true in marriage. That's true in every kind of relationship. Amen? Well, God did something amazing. He sent Jesus, a man. A man came onto the face of this planet filled with God to do what? To demonstrate who God is. Because that's what we were created to be. And in demonstrating who God is, He demonstrates who we are. Because we are created as image bearers. So now you have a man who's plugged in with God. He's not disconnected. And he does something amazing. He accomplishes our salvation. And so now you have a man who went to the cross to bring humanity into death. Amen? To, to put us out of our misery. And then he was raised from the dead to bring us life. And then he was seated at the right hand of the Father. So now you have one of us at the right hand of God. You have one of us who has received fullness from God. So i gotta, I got to land this on the verse for our day. And then I'm going to go back and start unpacking a little bit more. If you've got a Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Am I going too fast for you? Or am I going too slow for you? Hebrews chapter 2, I'm going to start at verse 2. It says, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, uh, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles, by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Now, this morning we're going to talk about the greatness of salvation because that's one of the things that had to wait until Jesus was with the right hand of the Father 
We, he could talk about salvation, but he couldn't give us salvation yet. Salvation had not yet been accomplished. And oftentimes we think of salvation mainly in terms of dying and going to heaven. Amen? We think of, of at the end of the day, we get forgiven for all of our sins. And that's very true. But I hope that you're beginning to see that salvation isn't something that you receive after you die in this body and so that you can go to heaven. There's a lot more to it than that. Because you were created to live in oneness with God, to be connected on the inside with an invisible cord like a Wi-Fi. You're just plugged in so that you can live stream heaven. Come on. So, so that you're not, you're not just running your own programs with all of their hiccups and bugs and lock up, you got to restart, you know, you know and all this stuff uh, that we do because we get locked in. Well, you shouldn't have done that. And all of a sudden, we're just locked in on what they did to me. Or, or we get worried about, oh, there's so many bills. Oh, God, you know, we get all focused on our problems. Or we get chasing that new shiny thing. Oh, i got to have one of them. Or, oh, man. She's hot, you know. We just all oh, chasing around out here. And Jesus came to set us free from all of that because it's all a lie. It's not what you were created for, it's not what you need. These are passing pleasures of sin. That's right. But at God's right hand are pleasures yes. forevermore, Amen. the fullness of joy. The fullness of joy. How many of you know if you, if you spend all morning eating potato chips and Tootsie Rolls, when Thanksgiving dinner is served, you're not going to be able to eat it. But you should have waited. Because you're going to have a tummy ache off all them chips and Tootsie Rolls. And you should have waited to have a nice nourishing meal that you can celebrate, not in private, because you've got that stash in your closet, <laughs> but something that you can enjoy openly without feeling dirty, with, you know, that you can enjoy with other people. The fullness of joy, the pleasures forevermore are at God's right hand. And those have been, we've been snatched out of God's right hand. We've been snatched out of God's presence. And so God puts His presence in a man to dwell among us, to live among us. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's you human beings were created to be, God containers. You are, you are created to be the host of another life form. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because in the invisible Spirit of God needs a person to dwell in so that he can display himself but he for him to display himself through you he has to reveal himself to you and you have to receive that revelation of what he is and who he is and what he says is true about you and you've got to unplug yourself from all of the lies that operate in your mind. You, you, gotta, you gotta get the rocks and the sand out of the gears so that the truth can plug in and begin to work in your mind. That's what's called repentance. That we turn from believing our own stuff and whatever we feel is right, whatever we think is right. And we look at Jesus and say, Jesus says, I am the truth, I am the way, I I am the life. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so if Jesus doesn't show it to you, then it's wrong. It's just wrong. You might even have Bible verses to support your belief. But if it doesn't look like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, and help you look like Jesus, walk like Jesus, and talk like Jesus, it's wrong. Let me explain it to you. The Bible, the Bible, Bible verses are like Lego pieces. Y'all got Legos? Yeah? Okay. You can make a lot of cool things out of Legos, can't you? But a lot of those Legos, they come in a box set, don't they? And so 
how do you know if you've put the, the Legos in that set together properly? By instructions. And do you read all them instructions or do you just look at the cover on the box? Tell the truth. You read the instructions? Okay, I, I'm a, I'm a, I, th I, th I throw the instructions away, I look at the cover on the box. But either way, right, if the end result doesn't look like the cover on the box, you might have made some cool things out of them little Lego pieces, but it's not right. I had that experience one time where we had a group of, uh, we had a little small group and there was some, uh, a young lady who brought a tub of Lego pieces and I looked in there and I saw a little, you know, a wheel on one side with a little connector piece and a wheel, I grabbed another wheel on another and that had a flat piece and I made me a little like rainbow Batmobile and I rolled it over to her and said, what do you think of that? She says, well, that's wrong. She took it all apart and threw all the pieces right back in. I was like, what do you mean? It rolls, it holds together, it looks pretty cool. And then God spoke to me, he said, that's what a lot of Christians do, is that we look for something that looks familiar. And, you know, this is what my granddaddy taught, or this is what I've always heard, or whatever. And we get some Bible verses, and we connect them together, and they, they seem to hold together, and they roll apart. But how do you know if your version of Christianity is the right version? Right? I mean, look, uh, look at the phone book under churches. There's kajillions of versions of sit and watch Christian television for a day. They will contradict one another. If you just sit there and watch for 12 hours or 8 hours, they will contradict one another. You'll have one come on in the morning and the one show right after it says the exact opposite. And they'll, they'll both call each other heretics. Well, how do you know which whether what you're believing is right because they both got Bible verses. There's a, there's a group, and I'm not sure how much they're operating anymore. Thank God they're not in the news, but there's a group uh, called Westboro Baptist Church. They used to go around with picket signs saying, God hates your soldiers, you know, uh, at funerals and stuff like that. You know, and that, they had Bible verses that show that, you know, that what they were doing was right. But I knew it was wrong. How do you know if it's right or if it's wrong? Listen, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. He's the cover on the box. And so if you take the Bible and you put it together and, and mix the ingredients together properly, at the end of the day, it should look like Jesus. It, you should have a Jesus cake that comes out of your oven. But you've got a lot of people now who are believing things and teaching things that Jesus didn't believe or teach. Let me give you an example. Oh, that's no big deal. Everybody sins. That's not how Jesus talked. That's not how Jesus walked. Oh, brother, God's just not going to heal you today because it's just not God's time. Did Jesus walk or talk like that? He didn't, did he? But yet, we got a lot of people that believe more in a misinterpretation of Paul's thorn oh <laughs> than we've got that will believe in Jesus. And they say, see, I got a Bible verse for it. Did it look, at the end of the day, the way you put those things together, does it look like the mind of Christ? Does it look like the Father? Amen? Amen. Now, we have been rescued. We have been saved from lies and brought into truth. We have been saved not only from the guilt of sin, right? What have, and this is why this is important, okay? I know if you're here, you're committed to Christ, okay? You've probably already prayed uh, and, and believed on Jesus for your salvation, amen? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But oftentimes, committed Christians can get deceived, and get suckered into this thing called legalism, okay? Now, I want to explain why this is important and, and why I felt like we need to start here. Uh, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul is writing to a group of churches that he established. 
And when he established them, he showed them Jesus Christ has removed the separation from you and God. He's taken your guilt. He's taken all that you were apart from God, and he put it to death for you. And now he has received the fullness of the Spirit of God. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He will forgive you, and he will give you the very Spirit of God on the inside. And now you can walk in his love, walk in his presence, and display who you were always created to be, your new creation. Now you get to learn to walk in the love of God and do that together and put God on display in your life. And then he left and he left them filled with God, walking in his love, walking in the spirit, believing on Jesus Christ, loving God, loving one another. And it was simple. It was powerful. It wasn't a big organization. It was a community of people with Jesus Christ at the center and filled with the Holy Spirit and putting God on display. And then somebody came up from Jerusalem and said, Paul forgot to tell you. There are 633 commandments of the Old Testament that you should be obeying. Stop eating bacon. You need to be circumcised. And circumcision was kind of like that, that baptism step. It was like once you get circumcised, that was, I mean, if you let somebody do that to your thingy, man, you're, you're all in, right? So it was kind of like the baptism of the Old Testament. You know, you get circumcised and that's, you're taking on, I'm going to follow all the laws of Moses. You know, like, like being baptized now means I'm all in. I belong to Jesus. He's Lord, right? And so... Uh, they were saying you've got to be circumcised and now you've got to do all these things that God commanded and see they'll take the heart that Jesus put in you to I want to love God I want to obey him fully I want to be fully his and now they'll tell you you're not adopted you're on probation and so you've got to do all of these things just right. And your standing with God, your relationship with God depends not on Jesus, but on how you do. And listen, we don't struggle so much more with the laws of Moses. We got all these Christian rules. You got to go to church every Sunday. You got to wear certain things. You got to stop. And some of those things are okay and they're not wrong to do. But if you start basing your standing with God on anything that you do, now your eyes are off of Jesus Christ and you're trying to add to his finished work. Now, let me tell you how this looked. Let me tell you how this looks looked like for me. Y'all know the when you go to the fair, they have these things sometimes uh, where there's a bell at the top and they give you this old puny sledgehammer and you're supposed to just whack that thing and they got this old iron <laughs> bar. You know, you can barely get it to go up and they make you look like a fool. But you got to hit it and if you hit it hard enough, you can make the bell ring. Well, I kind of viewed, I didn't realize this, but I knew that I believed in Jesus. At the end of the day, I was going to be with God in heaven. That's good news. And when I saw Jesus, I was going to be just like him. So I knew at the end of the day, it's going to be okay. But meanwhile, I still wanted to obey God. I wanted to have a good relationship with God. And so at first, I, nobody really told me how to live in the fullness of salvation now. And so I thought salvation was something I was going to get. But meanwhile, now... Yes, you get saved by grace. Have you ever heard this? You get saved by grace, but then you got to get sanctified. You got to sanctify yourself, right? And so, but my Bible says Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our righteousness. So what if the faith that saves us is the faith that we're to walk in? Well, that's not how I was walking. I was walking thinking, well, I'm going to try the best I can today to do everything that God wants me to do. And I know that I'm never going to be able to get it all the way to 100%, but maybe I can get it up to 25%. And then Jesus, he fills in the 75. Or maybe I have a really good day and I get it up to 50%, you know. And then Jesus, he's the other half. That was the mindset I had. Check yourself. Is that your mindset? Because if that's your mindset, the pressure's on you every single day. 
I got good news for you, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ is our righteousness, 100%. He is always our full standing. We don't add something to that, and we don't take anything away from that. We can either believe that and receive that and stand in that and walk in that, or we can forget that and become blind to our salvation and, and forget our purification from our former sins and, and start declining and neglecting our great salvation and there's a consequence to that you guys got to, to Galatians didn't you chapter 4 look at what he says in verse 15 when good godly sincere Christians start living under legalism one of the signs is this he says in verse 15 where then is that sense of blessing that you had where then is that sense of blessing that you had? You know, instead of, oh, praise you, Father, thank you that you love me with a love that I couldn't earn and I can't lose and I don't deserve. Thank you that you love me just like your son and that you've clothed me with robes of righteousness and that you've forgiven me and that you've made me clean and that you've given me your spirit and that this day I get to walk with you and be yours and to let you just flow out of me freely. I don't have to do background checks to see if people are worthy of being loved. I don't have to look at my circumstances to see how you feel about me today, whether it's He loves me, He loves me not. I look at the cross and say He loves me yes. this much. Yes. And you forget that. And you start waking up and going, Oh God, I hope I don't screw up today. And you become a sin conscious person instead of a Christ conscious person. Yes. God wants to bring you into a heart uh, that is so filled and aware of His presence and His love and His mercy and His grace. And that's what makes you holy. That's what makes you sanctified. That's what fills you. And you have a sense of being blessed instead of striving for salvation, striving uh, for walking in the favor of God. There's a, there's a misinterpretation of a very common word in Romans chapter 5. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And we have obtained our introduction into this grace in which we stand. Right? Now, let me unpack that for a second. There's a word that's justified. You know what that word means? Y'all probably heard it over and over. Just as if... I've never sinned. That's what's wrong with that word. That is wrong. We're going to throw that out for a second, okay? Because here's, here's, what, here's what justified means. Just, of it, just as if I've never sinned, that's half of what that really means. Here's the deal. If y'all are in debt, anybody ever been in debt, you don't have to raise your hand. If you're in debt and you have creditors that are calling you, say, where's my money? Where's my money? Where's my money? You know, after a while, you stop picking up your phone. You don't want to go out of your house. You know, or you, you, got, you install alarm systems. You build up more debt. You know, you install alarm systems because you don't want the repo man coming to tow your vehicle away. You know, all this. You park down the street so they won't be able to find it. <laughs> uh, I get that from YouTube videos. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> anyway, so here's the, here's the interesting thing with that. If somebody comes along and says, I'm going to pay all of your debt, that is good news. But it only brings you back to zero. It only brings you back to zero. And so what does that mean for the rest of your life? If you, if you don't have a job, if you don't have any income, you don't have an annuity or an inheritance that you're going to live off of, you might end up getting right back in debt again. And most Christians, they pray to receive Christ and they get an initial relief that says, Oh, thank you, Lord, that I'm forgiven. And then they go rack up a little bit more debt the next day. And then they think, oh my gosh. And they go back into this, this whole guilt complex. And they never learn how to, that they were justified. Do you know what that means? It does not mean just as if I'd never sinned. It means just as if I'd done everything that God ever required. Good. 
just as if I'd done it all right. Jesus not only pays your debt, He credits to your account His full righteousness. He puts, he, He signs you up on His bank account. And He is rich in righteousness. That's why we talked about last night that Paul said, uh, having not a righteousness of my own based on law, but a righteousness which is of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that he who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf so that we might be made the righteousness of God. Yeah. That God has made you as righteous as Jesus is. Jesus, when He lived, here's the cool thing about it. This is what I want you to get. How did you become a fallen human being? What did you do to get fallen? Man, you just got born, right? Adam did everything that you needed to, get, to, to be a, become a fallen human being, right? Because you were inside of Adam. Right? So when Adam was born in captivity, congratulations, you were born in captivity. Amen? If, uh, if, if an African chief is a chief in Africa but then gets captured by slave traders and sold to America, guess what? He becomes a slave and his children are born in captivity. Do you understand that? Do you know that I, I went to, my family and I, we went to the Creation Museum. Any of y'all been down there? Okay, it's a really fascinating place. It's worth it even if you don't believe in a young earth six-day creation. Uh, It's just awesome. I I tend to believe that. But I think, because I think that's what God's Word teaches. And it's awesome. But I'm not going to fight over that. All right? (laughs) They like to fight over it down there. I'm I'm, I'm not fighting about that. But here's the cool thing. I believe everything that God's Word says... So I think that's really cool. I really believe that there was a real Adam. There, there was a real Eve. There was a real Noah, you're right? There, there was a real worldwide flood. So I, I look at that, man, that's just awesome to see how that really explains well what we observe in science. But here's the cool thing about that. They're showing Noah's ark. And I had this thought to myself, I rode in that ark. Do you know that? Y'all rode in that ark too. Because if that ark would have had a hole in the bottom of it and sunk, how many of us would have been here? Because you know why? Because we were inside of Noah. That's right. So when God wanted to get rid of an old creation and to start a new creation, He brought a man from the old creation into the new creation. And everybody that was in that man came into the new creation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, you were in Adam. And there was a life you were born with from Adam that was subject. But God sent a new creation man onto the face of the planet. And he was was actually born of somebody who was of the old creation. And so as soon as Jesus set foot on the planet, who is now the oldest human being that ever lived? Jesus. He's the Ancient of Days. So now he supersedes Adam. So you were in Adam, but now guess what? Christ comes onto the planet and you are in Christ. Now He lives a righteous life on your behalf. He dies the death that you and I deserve to die on your behalf. So when Jesus died, He wasn't the only one who died upon that cross. You were crucified with Christ. You were on that cross with Him. And the old corrupt life that is born in slavery to sin, born in rejection, born alienated, born under condemnation, born subject to the devil, died. That old generationally cursed you died. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) And you were risen with Christ and seated with Christ in heavenly realms. So that when you became born again, the new you came into you. And the new you is the real you. And the old you is dead and gone. That's why it's old. Amen? You don't have two yous. That's right. You only got 
the real you. That's who God relates to. That's who God sees. That's who God knows. And here's the cool thing about it. That's the only you He's ever known. Before the foundations of the world, He saw the new you. The new you is older than the old you. (laughs) He looked in Christ and He marked you out. And then He sent you in Christ, life, your life, into this world. And then He crucified the old you. Thank God. (laughs) Amen. Amen. And then He raised you up together with Him and seated you together with Him. That is an awesome salvation. That is an awesome salvation. Now, you get to learn to walk in this freedom, to walk in this power. Here's the cool thing about it. Salvation, you can kind of think of salvation from what? Jesus said, when you pray, pray this, deliver us from evil. Well, what kind of evil? All of it, right? You don't have to pick and choose. Sin, shame, guilt, sickness, disease, destruction, evil. All of it. The thief came to steal Kill, steal, and destroy. All of it. So guess what? You get salvation in Christ. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. And brought us into the kingdom of light in His Son. So now... Adam represented us before God and he was a screw up and brought us into his mess. Amen. And we were born in his mess, a mess. And Jesus came and he rectified the whole situation, put Adam and his race to death and was raised up, seated with the father. And now your life, your eternal life is the resurrection life of Christ. You are a new creation and that can't be messed up because everything that could mess it up, Jesus overcame it. Jesus buried it. Jesus defeated it. And He did that for you and for me. So now we get to learn to live from victory instead of trying to achieve it. We get to learn from, live from salvation, live from blessing, live from that place of standing and oneness and fullness instead of always trying to strive for our breakthrough, trying to strive for our victory trying to look forward because God is I am. I am your salvation. I am your righteousness. I am your provision. I am your wholeness. I am your healer. Not I'm going to be. And Jesus is the I am God who has come to set us free by bringing us His life. Christ is our life. Christ is our salvation. You know... um, there was a point where, and you, you mentioned this this morning, it was really funny. Uh, there was a point where some of Jesus' friends sent for him and said, Lord, the one whom you love is sick. And Jesus stayed two days later, and then he came to Lazarus' tomb. Right? And the, the sisters met him, and he said, did not, did not tell you that if you believed, you would see greater things. And he said, oh, Lord, we, we believe That on the last day, God's going to raise him from the dead. See, he said, but then he corrected him and said, Resurrection is not a day. I am the resurrection and the life. Your healing is not an event. I am your healer, says the Lord. I am your righteousness. I am your salvation. It's not an event that takes place out there sometime in the future. It's who God is for you. And that cannot change. But it will change us when we see it. It will change us when we receive that. Instead of looking forward and striving, God does not have to do anything to get a breakthrough. Do you understand? He's already broken through. The veil has been torn. And there's a man who's broken through every barrier, broken the power of sin, the power of shame, the power of guilt, the power of death, the power of the devil. And he and you are in him so that when you called on the name of the Lord, when you heard the gospel, there was this thing. 
this umbilical cord of heaven that shot out of the side of Jesus and went right into you. And now the life that's, that raised Jesus from the dead is... pulsating inside of you. That is your life. That is your life. Christ is your life. So it's no longer us who lives, but Christ who lives in us. And the life we live, we live by the faith of the Son of God. Do you know inside that life is the faith of the Son of God? Inside that life is the righteousness of the Son of God, the holiness of the Son of God, the healing of the Son of God, the power of the Son of God, the words of the Son of God. Wow. And that you can actually learn to connect your insides to what God put in your spirit so that you actually enter in on your inner man into the very fellowship of the Trinity that you have been invited into what God has been experiencing between the Father and the Son by sharing one spirit forever and ever for all eternity and he's invited you to come into that place by sharing in everything that he gives to the Son you get adopted into the Son you get adopted into his same relationship you get adopted and given the same spirit so now the father's love is multiplied in you now sometimes i used to wonder what does god get out of this deal have you ever wondered like why is this so important to god i want to let you know something here's what's important to god when when my wife had our first child was the first time I experienced this, okay? We had been home for maybe a couple weeks and I was, I was reflecting on this new experience of being a dad. And I remember looking at my wife and I said, sweetheart, on the day that I married you, I gave myself to you completely and I love you. I loved you then with all of my heart. But as we've grown, our love has grown. Because I loved you as I knew you then, but as I've known you more, there's, there, our love has grown because of our relationship. But now, it's like our love has taken on a whole new dimension because I used to love you as my wife only, but now I love you as my wife and the mother of my children my child and so uh, uh, our love has increased in a dimension and you and I are the love gift between the father and the son <laughs> that every one of us that comes to the father in the son not only does he loved the Son perfectly and completely, but that love is expanded and grows and is multiplied. And we get to participate in that so that now there's something like that that happens for us that I write these things to you so that our joy might be made complete because I, I enjoy that the Father is expanded joy. It expands in me. We get to look on anyone else that we share the love of God for. So that's why in Galatians 4.15 where he says, Where is then is this sense of blessing that you had? Here's the thing I want you to get, okay? Some of you might be, I thought this was kind of like going to focus on power evangelism. We're getting to the foundation of power evangelism, okay? Galatians 4.15, Paul says, Where is that sense of blessing that you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying, listen, when you had that sense of blessing, it produced in you self-sacrificing love. You would have just plucked out your eyes and given them to me. You would have done, what does that mean? Was something wrong with Paul's eyes? No, if I call my wife and say, man, these people here are awesome. They give me the shirt off their back. And you're like, well, didn't you do any laundry? No, she's not going to say that. It's a figure of speech. <laughs> do you understand? It's a sacrificing figure of speech. Listen, the reason that people 
tend not to talk to strangers and step out in faith is because they're, they've got all these questions of, am I good enough? Am I worthy enough? Am I this? Am I that? It is not about what you am. It's about who He am. Amen? <laughs> and He lives in you. It's what you were created to be from the first place. So all that stuff that interrupted that got crucified. And so let us not neglect so great a salvation. Let's walk in that salvation because it sets us free from the power and the grip of evil and guilt and shame uh, and inferiority complex so that we can walk in the fullness of Jesus and be filled with God. Yes. And God is love and He just pours out. And so now when you see somebody, instead of wondering, I wonder how they're going to respond if I just go and talk to them and just letting fear win the day. That now it's like, you know, I don't care. Let them rip my eyes out. I'm going, <laughs> I got to let this come out because I'm not worried about what they think. I know what God thinks. I'm not worried about how they feel. I know how God feels. And I, um, I remember one time, this was just a real... Uh, poignant time in my life uh, there was a guy I was ministering actually in Pennsylvania and there was a guy on the college campus there and uh, one of my favorite ways to minister is, it, to young people is I like to find them in a group and then I'll walk up to them and say hey guys you want to see something cool because they're they got to be kind of nerds to not want something cool to see something cool most kids are like bored with life now, this might not be your way of doing it, but I just want to share this is a way to do things. You know, a lot of times as Christians, when we go out uh, to try to talk to people or just show the love of God, we look for the individual, the isolated one, because we feel a lot more comfortable approaching one. And that's how I started, and that's fine. Uh, but it's neat when you can approach a group of people because now they're in their comfort zone. And you're the one outnumbered, so they feel more comfortable. Sometimes we're approaching just one because that feels comfortable to us, right? And so when you know who God is in you, you're never outnumbered. So I walked up to a group of students and I said, hey guys, you want to see something cool? I said, which of you has like an injury or something gives you aches or pains that didn't heal properly? And one guy says, I've had bad knees since I've been young. And I said, so right now you feel pain? He said, I always feel pain. And I said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my hand on your knee and then I just want you to tell me the truth because I believe all this pain can go away right now. So I put my hand on his knee and I said, in Jesus' name. And as soon as I said that, the girl on the stairs, she burst out laughing like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what a goofy, you know? And I just said, in Jesus' name, all pain come out of his knees. Knees be healed right now. And I just ignored it, right? And so then I stepped back and I said, now try your knees. And he moved his knees and he goes, man, they were just hurting. And he said, well, it's when I go up in the stairs. That's the real test. I said, there's the stairs, man. Have at it. And he goes up and down the stairs. He's coming up the stairs. He's going, man, I can't believe this. And, and I said, now, are you just lying to make me feel better in front of all your friends? And he said, no. No, I mean, this is true. I said, I, I, and so I asked his friends, so do you know how this happened? They're like, oh, we don't know. Is it like magic? And I said, no, it's not magic. It's Jesus. He is the real deal. And I don't care if your church was boring or not. Listen, Jesus is not boring. Jesus is amazing. Jesus is, is the creator of the universe, having walked among us as a man, lived as a man, died as a man, rose again. And now he is savior of all. And he just healed this guy's knees as a sign to you that Jesus will save you. Jesus will will rescue you and you guys need to turn your lives over to him because what he did for this guy's knees he'll do for your whole life and they're like wow and, and I said so do you have a Bible and some of them had Bible I said please go home and read this please you know because they weren't that was about as far as they were willing to go you don't you know it's neat you want to it says make the most of every opportunity and so you learn that sometimes there's seed planting and then sometimes there's reaping. God talks about you sow, you water, you reap. And sometimes in the church, we've made it all about we got to reap everybody, you know, and the harvest is white. Uh, but we need to we need to also pay attention that uh, you don't pluck right, unripe fruit. You don't force people. You give grace. And, when, and sometimes the the most of every opportunity depends on. How much opportunity are they giving you? And so when it stops feeling like grace, then it's time to leave the seed in there. Right? 
Okay, so I I got done with that encounter. And I was pretty excited and you know, had to have my posse with me. You know, he's walking around and and then I I, I was looking for our next victim. You know, <laughs> who can we who can we share God's love with? And I'm I'm looking around and and it was like it was no longer in between classes. There was like it was like a ghost town. I said, tumbleweed. And I looked over here and there was one guy sitting on the bench and he had a green mohawk and a bunch of tattoos and piercings. And I looked over there and I. Looking back on it now, I think, have you ever been staring at somebody and forget you're staring? You know, he must have been just looking at us. But when I looked down over at him, he, he kind of did one of these things. And I interpreted it as, buddy, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever it is, just keep it up there. Don't come at me with that stuff. That's the way I interpreted it. That's the way it went off in my head. Looking back on it, I think he was like, oh, I'm looking. You know, I, I don't mean to stare. But anyway, so I, I started walking down the steps and I started, I interpreted that as don't come over here. So I started looking, well, maybe there's somebody else around here. And I looked everywhere and there was nobody. So we did what a lot of Christians do on an outreach. When you don't see anybody that looks receptive, we started talking amongst ourselves. Just wasting time and... No, there's nothing wrong with good fellowship, but I couldn't enjoy my fellowship because the Holy Spirit just kept talking over everybody. You ever try to have a conversation and God just won't be quiet? <laughs> and God's like, what are you doing? And inside myself, I'm like chickening out. And he said, no, you are not. And I said, okay. And he said, if that guy wants to reject you, why don't you just go over there and man up and make him reject you? But meanwhile, why don't you go over there and overcome evil with good? Wow. Wow. You know, it's like, what are you afraid of rejection for? If he wants to reject you, just make him do it. It's not going to hurt you. I mean, that's God's mindset. It's like, who cares what he's going to do? Are you going to do what I told you to do? And I was like, hey, guys, hey, let, let's shut this down. Let's go talk to this guy over here. So I just walked over there, and I had my cowboy hat on. It was summer, and it was hot. And, uh, and so I got, you know, about from here to the middle of there. And, and, um, and he could tell and he's walking over towards me. You know, he had his MP3 buds in, and so he plucked one MP3 bud out. Uh, and I said, I said, hey, man, I like your hair. Now, what does that mean? Any of my kids come home with hair like that, I'm not going to like that hair. All right. But I decided to like his hair right then. Why? Because I'm showing him favor. I'm letting my speech be seasoned, as it were, with salt. I'm letting grace. I'm choosing. Because if anybody's going to do that to their hair, you know, they're doing it because they're making a statement. Usually it's like, I don't care about what y'all think is normal. Right? I'm tired of normal. And so he's doing that because he wants... Everybody know he's not normal. I was like, hey, man, I like your hair. And I said, how long has it been that color? He said, well, a couple months. I said, I bet you get a lot of comments. He goes, yeah. And I said, and then I did the big reveal and took my cowboy head off. I said, truthfully, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed, you know, because he saw the, 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 the laser beam go, you know, <laughs> shoot off the top of my head. And, uh, and then... I just turned the conversation. I said, hey, man, we're out here praying for people today, and we're just believing God for miracles, and we're not checking to see who's been naughty or nice. And, and there was a guy up here who had bad knees, and his, he just got healed. Is there anything that we could pray for you about? And he goes, well, you know, truthfully, not sickness, but do you guys pray for depression? And I was like, absolutely, dude, we can pray for that. And um and I said, how long have you been battling this? He said, it's been a while. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. The same way that God didn't create that guy's knees to be racked in pain, He didn't create your heart to be in depression and discouragement and a lack of peace and in anxiety. So we're just going to let God take all of the discouragement and the darkness and the negativity out. And we're going to invite Him to put His peace and His wholeness in, okay? And so I put my hands on Him and I said, right now, in the name of Jesus... Everything causing this depression, you loose him right now. Anxiety go, fear go, regret, shame out of him. And I just release the peace of God, peace of God, I just fill his heart right now. And I look down at him, you know, I was standing a little bit behind him now. I look down at him, he had this goofy grin, he just kind of rocking like this. And I, and I said, I said, what are you feeling? And he said, 
I don't know, but it's good. <laughs> and I, I, said, I said, dude, that's Jesus. He's taken that depression out of you. And then I get this word in my spirit. The word was witchcraft, right? Now, some of you have heard God before, and you know sometimes He'll speak to you, but He speaks to you in a way that you're not necessarily to say the exact thing that He says. Uh, he understands that He's showing you in a way that's important for you, but the way you say it, you need to use wisdom, right? right? Just because your mom and dad talk about Aunt Sally's wart on her chin doesn't mean when Aunt Sally comes over, you know, you shouldn't be talking negatively about it, but you know, you sort of mentioned that you got to understand some discretion. Well, he said witchcraft. So I said to him, I said, man, there's a lot of spiritualities out there that aren't connected directly to Jesus Christ. Have you been involved in any of them? And he said, yeah, I have. And I've been wondering if they're not making this depression worse. And I said, buddy, I think God just showed me that. I said, are you ready to let all that stuff go and to give your life completely to Jesus? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, I want you to pray this with me. And I, I just led him through a simple prayer. I renounce, uh, I, ren I, ren I give my life completely to Jesus. Uh, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I give myself to you. And I renounce all forms of spirituality that aren't of God. And that's all I had him pray. And so then I said, well, devil, you heard him right now in Jesus' name. Go, right? And he goes, you ever seen one of them little, uh, you know, used car dealy things that go like that? He goes, oh. you know. <laughs> and, and, and he got set free right then. He got set free right then. But listen, this all started from me reacting in the flesh and judging people and trying to summarize things and and all and it, it's all wrong ladies and gentlemen there's not a single person that you will meet that god hasn't said they're worth dying for there's not a single person that you will meet that god hasn't paid a mighty price so that he can redeem them and bring them into the kingdom and bring them into this salvation listen this salvation is not just for us this salvation is for them it is a great salvation. He wants, he wants them back. He's paid a mighty price to set them free in their bodies, to set them free in their hearts. And listen, if light has never been given to them, how are they going to receive it? Of course they're going to be filled with darkness. But we've got to shine light. We've got to give them light. We've got to give them love. We've got to be patient with them just as God was patient with us. So brothers and sisters, that is what this is all about. Let us receive the blessing. Let us stir up that sense of praise the Lord and, and stir up your heart to delighting in the Lord. Uh, George Mueller said, I feel that it is my first and primary duty to get my soul happy in God every day. Do you know that uh, when, when, uh, when the air pressure drops in the airplane, the air mask drop down and they tell if you have a young child with you, you put the air mask on yourself first. Why? Because then you can help them. But if you decide you're going to try to fumble around with theirs and then you go unconscious, they can't help you. They are too small. And so you have got to get yourself happy with God. You've got to abide in Christ. And when you put the air mask on you and inhale Jesus, guess what? Not only are you abiding in the air mask, everything in the air mask abides in you. Now you can bear fruit and help other people. Amen? So we need to, to come out of legalism and out of pressure. And, and, God want, and you have to do all these things to keep God off your back. Listen, Jesus didn't go about healing people because He was trying to get God to feel better about Him. Before he did a thing, he was simply baptized and the father said, Behold my son in whom I am well pleased. And our ministry has got to start there. That I stand in the pleasure of the, of the father as a son. And I'm not doing ministry to try to achieve something, try to earn something from God. I'm just wanting to let flow out of me what I've received from heaven. Amen? Amen. And we can do that. And then that sets us free from being slaves to other people's opinions. That's right. 
<laughs> and worrying and wondering and trying to keep ourselves safe from other people. See, the gospel gives us salvation so that we're safe and God is our safety. Because if it isn't true, it doesn't get in. We're a water bottle filled. They can spew all kinds of dirt and sand or whatever. We just wash it off because it's all on the outside. Because the words that are, the Father has spoken. Do you see how Jesus says over and over, I'm just speaking to you what I've heard from my Father. You know, and people over and over, you call yourself this and you think that. And he's like, I'm just speaking to you what the Father, you know. Well, you, we call you, you, you're a devil, you're a deceiver. He said, no, I'm a son. <laughs> I'm a son. Not only do I bear witness of myself, my Father bears witness of me. <laughs> y'all just going to have to get over it. If I change what I'm saying, then I'd be a liar just like y'all but I don't, I don't speak lies because I don't know lies, right? And so we don't have to go around afraid. We don't have to go around uh, dejected and under condemnation. We get to walk in our salvation and we get to let salvation just come out of us because what you're filled with is what will come out of you. Yes. Amen? Amen? So Father, I thank you for my brothers and my sisters. I thank you in Jesus' name for the reality of our salvation in Christ. And we will not neglect this salvation. I want you to stand with me. One of the best ways to get the Word of God in you is to let it come out of you. The Word of God says, we believe, therefore we speak. Amen? Amen. And so let's, let's just make some declarations together. I'm going to make a declaration and then you can just repeat that. Okay? Father, I believe in Jesus. Father, I believe in Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Savior. He is my representative. He is my representative. He is my righteousness. He is my righteousness. He is the Spirit that dwells within me. He is the Spirit that dwells within me. You are my fullness. You are my fullness. Fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me with your truth. Fill me with your truth. I cast off rejection. I cast off rejection. I cast off fear of man. Cast off fear of men. And I give myself over to you. I give myself over to, to, you. Be to be your vessel. A willing vessel. A willing vessel. Filled, with filled with truth. Filled with, filled with, filled with your love. Filled with your, love. Filled with your mercy. Filled with your mercy. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Open doors. Open doors. Around me. Around me. Open my, Open my heart. To see people differently. To see people differently. And to treat everyone. And to treat everyone. With the, love of Christ. with the love of Christ. I will not be afraid of man. I will not be afraid of man. I am free. I am free. To love. To love. Because there is no law against love. Because there is no law against love. I can even love and get it wrong. I can even love and get it wrong. And there's no law against it. I am free to make mistakes, to be misjudged, to be misunderstood, because my Father knows me, and He has commissioned me to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. This is God's idea, and I will walk in the freedom that He has given me, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's good stuff. So if you're here this morning and you would like prayer for anything, uh, I'm happy to pray, but I will uh, close everything down here unless you guys have any questions. I guess, uh, are we doing okay on time? Did y'all get your money's worth? <laughs> I can keep going if you want. How are we doing? It's been good. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Any questions, comments? It's okay if you got some. Uh, some, some ladies asking about offering. Do you want to do, yeah. do it in the evenings or how do you want to? If, you, if you're not going to be here in the evenings and you want to give now, you can bring your offering up and just lay it on the bench up here. Um, or we'll, we'll be receiving offerings in the evenings yeah. also. Okay. So either way is fine. It's up to you. Some people may, may right. want to be able may to in come the in the morning. Okay. So um, God bless you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Father, I thank you uh, for each one here. 
Lord, you, your word says that you give seed to the sower yes. and thank you. bread to the eater. And I just ask that you, I uh, thank you for the sowers, that even as they give, that they give out of what you've put in their hand. Yes. And I thank you that as they give, your word says that you give more, that you increase seed to the sower. So I ask that you bless them, that you provide for all their needs. Um, in Jesus' mighty name.